Hi everybody, it's Friday. We made it. I don't think I've ever posted a video on a Friday yet. And when I woke up this morning, I just thought it was very fitting because Friday is Venus's day and you know, it's, it's a day for love and I feel like it's a day for showing love, showing emotion, showing admiration, showing gratefulness. We do a lot of, you know, self-care and self-love on our Fridays. And um, I, I just woke up and had this brainy idea that because I've been sort of dealing with negative masculine energies for several weeks now, why not spin it and make today about positive masculine energies? And, and I don't mean like positive as in like uber, you know, light worker type energies. I mean, just like good for your soul feelings that you get when, when you think about, I guess, a masculine energy that just clicks. I hope that makes sense. And as I get into the video, I'm hoping it'll make more sense. So, <laughs> so I woke up and I made a list of men, you know, not so much directly, you know, influencing my life, but, you know, artists and certain hobbies and certain um, just celebrities, if you will, that when I think of them, they, they make my heart happy, you know? And, and I kind of wanted to use today to spotlight that because like I said, I've been such a negative Nancy for several weeks dealing with, with my envy-ish that I thought, you know, now that I'm on the upswing, I'm on the other side of this thing, why not, yeah, why not um, put a spotlight on men that, that have, have been good through and through? So that's going to be a portion of, of today's little chat. Allow me to take a sip. I, well, it might be too hot. We'll wait. So before we get into that, because I think I want to end with that, I thought we'll do some show and tell, some random show and tell. And I also wanted to share something that I've recently added to my, to my daily practice, because if found it extremely powerful and really special. And I think it's gonna be here for quite a while cause I need it. And I thought, oh my gosh, I, I have to share it with you guys too. So I apologize, I'm a little sporadic. Perhaps that's Friday, perhaps that's Mercury in re retrograde. I don't know. I'll try to stay slow, just stick with me. Um, but let's begin, shall we? So I'm gonna do a little bit of um, knitting show and tell because I haven't done that yet. And I thought, why the hell not? So this, let me show you the picture. Uh, Plymouth Yarn is a pretty well-known yarn company. Um, we used to sell a lot of their yarns um, in the yarn shop. And I had been making a sweater and I don't know, it just wasn't giving me, it just wasn't filling my cup, you know? And then I saw this one randomly and I was like, you know what, this one, this one might fill my cup, but I have issues with it. And I'm zooming in as close as I can because the issue I have is that the front of it, I feel like there needs to be buttonholes. I feel like there needs to be a button flap. And I find it so very odd that uh, they're kind of marketing this as a finished piece because to me it's like clearly not. I'm also not quite a fan of the sleeves and I think, I don't know if it is what it is. I'm, I might, I might do the sleeves over. <laughs> we'll see. Because I tend to be, I can't believe I'm saying this because I'm really not traditional by any means, but I tend to be traditional with my sweaters and I like basic ribbing. 
And I'm just going to kind of go through things because I'm, I'm going to assume that a lot of you aren't knitters, but just so that I'm not talking a different language, I'm going to try to explain some things. Um, so to start, I have the body pretty much done. We're like up to the armpits, basically. Um, oh my gosh, I'm showing you guys the inside. It's lovely because it's kind of reversible, but uh, this is <laughs> this is the actual <laughs> the actual pattern. So I'm trying to like pull it back here so that it's not in the candle flame because we don't need an incident. But that's that. Just the boring, you know, gray sweater that I thought I want something that to throw on, you know, like when I'm home here on a perfect, like today's a perfect day. It's gray skies, it's rainy, it's been super windy. We actually have some flood warnings, like today's the day that I would wear that sweater. So that's what I want. I want like this all purpose, just like, I don't even care how it looks sweater, although here I am nitpicking that it doesn't have a button tap. Um, yeah, so there's that. And then I started the sleeve maybe like a day ago, two days ago or something. And it's just really weird construction because it has you make what I'm assuming is going to be like this stupid flap that you'll seam to the inside. I guess just to have kept the cable stitching from flaring out, like sometimes it would, but that could have been prevented if you just did a ribbed cuff. And that, that was kind of what I was trying to say two minutes ago. Like, I don't understand you know, why the pattern was created with a ribbed hem, <laughs> but yet we didn't do ribbed cuffs. So I'm trying to decide if I like that. I mean, clearly I don't, let's be honest, I don't. <laughs> so whatever, like a day's worth of work, I might rip the whole thing out and I might just do ribbing and, and be happy and, and then work it back up and then, um, I am definitely going to modify and create a button flap and find some really cute buttons. And that's my work in progress thus far. So yeah, if you are a knitter, um, I'm like, I'll, I'll post the pattern. It's a free pattern I found on Ravelry. Yeah, why not? I, it, there's nothing to lose by posting it. So I will post a link to it. Um, you have to be a member of Ravelry to get it, but Ravelry is free to join and most knitters know what Ravelry is. It's like Facebook for knitters. So um, yeah, I'll put that there if you guys are interested. Um, and I guess while I'm talking about it, because I think inclusivity is a super big deal, let's see what the size ranges are. Plymouth typically does a good job. Um, so it goes from small to double XL. So finished chest measurements are 44 inches, which is quite a lot of ease, um, up to 60 inches. So it's pretty standard. I don't know that it's, yeah, but, but if you're interested, there it is. <laughs> and we can knit along, you know, <laughs> if you feel so inclined. Um, so yeah, so there's that. So... Maybe my coffee has cooled down a little bit. Hmm. Oh my gosh, it's like, you know, when it's rainy outside and windy, you just get like this chill to the bone. And yeah, I just needed something warm this morning. So um, this week, oh, uh, well, gosh, how do I want to start this? How do I want to start this? Well, th this week has been a complete change in my way of thinking, you know, because I've said goodbye to something and I'm really trying to bring in brand new thoughts and ideas. And, um, earlier this week, well, no, let me, let me back up just a little further. I've always known that Kim Kranz has existed within the tarot community because so many people speak so highly I would say specifically about her like animal spirit. Is that a tarot or that might be an Oracle? And then she's got pocket editions and I know she has a tarot deck and the deck just like never jived with me for some reason. Like I just, I just couldn't connect. Like when, whenever I saw people post images of the cards on, on screen, it's like, mm, okay. And then, um, of course, of course, all it takes is like that one moment where you're a sucker, <laughs> I swear to God. 
uh, Racing, Owl Moon 513 was doing a little review of the pocket edition of the Archetypes Guidebook that I guess was just recently released. And she was doing like a comparison with the small, the pocket edition versus the large original edition. And I'll be honest, it wasn't so much her like review of this. It was that I actually went on to Amazon and I went through the reviews I had probably already went through the reviews, you know, months ago and we're like, eh, I'll pass. But I went through the reviews and somebody had shown the archetype for Queen. And then, you know, Kim Crayon's words and message for, for what that archetype meant. And I was, I was like, okay, you know, now I can get behind this because it just spoke to me. Then all of a sudden there was this connection. And I thought, my God, I, I think I have to get this. So then I'm like, you know, perusing the Instagram like we do, you know, little snoopers. And I just, I just thought, you know, what's Kim Crayon up to these days? What does she do? <laughs> and, um, you know, I just scroll through a little bit and I saw that she did an interview on a podcast called Love is the Author. And I thought this is great because I am going to purchase the Archetypes Oracle. I am going to purchase the Alchemy Oracle. I'm, I'm psyched for them now. I'm ready, Kim. Um, but I want to know a little bit more about her. Are, is anybody else like this? Like, that's how you get me to buy things. <laughs> like, FYI, like, I hate when people blast whatever they blast. Like, I like want to get to know you and I, I got, I got to like figure it out for myself. I don't want you to come at me trying to sell me something. Like I need to figure out for myself if I really want what you're selling. So this is how we know I'm hooked now is kind of what I'm trying to say. And, um, I thought, yeah, let me listen to her speak. Let me listen to her speak about, you know, what's, um, inspired her to create these decks and let me hear, a little bit about her spiritual journey because I'm sure that's what you know a little bit of this inter interview is going to be about and it most certainly was and um, I've got a, a deeper respect for her obviously than I did you know two weeks ago and um, I feel an even deeper connection with her because she's also a fellow musician and she's I don't know that she's exploring sound baths, but it's something very similar where she's just recently, either she's just recently released a record or it's about to come out. And it's, it's you know, kind of like the background noise you would have on when you're doing yoga or when you're doing meditation. And, um, and so I, I was just like so inspired by just like all these, like she's so multifaceted in her spirituality where she's, you know, drawing, I mean, the creativity this woman has, I mean, it's like, it's on overload, it seems, 24-7. And, um, and so this podcast, this interview with her back and forth just kind of goes into that. And, and I thought it was really interesting, too, the pressures that she was kind of under um, to stay within a box, as most people oftenly are told to do within any specific industry or niche, you know, that like with tarot, and, and her oracles, like, well, you know, people weren't going to be too interested in, in her if she, you know, wanted to be a little wacky and, and, and do something different than what everybody else offers. And, uh, and she stuck to her gut and she stuck to what her soul told her to do. And, and she's, you know, been true to herself and, and created obviously some fabulous tools for us to use. <sighs> so I kind of digress, but I had to tell you this because I pulled um, the sustainer card earlier this week and it wasn't like a very, like some decks, you know, I feel like soul card was a, was a really good example of a, of a deck or a card that just really makes me sit with something. The sustainer I didn't really sit with. I was kind of like nonplussed by it if I'm being completely honest, but I've I've been working with it because I thought, you know, no, regardless, it's it's got to teach me something. And where I think I'm at today, Friday, April, what is it, April 12th? <laughs> I hope, yeah, I think so, April 12th, because Monday's the 15th. Um, 
is that I want to be surrounded by men that sustain me, right? That's like kind of the connection I've kind of made thus far, which is why I'm, you know, this whole episode is kind of like honoring men that um, do bring me joy and do sustain me. So, so that's kind of where I'm at with that. So thank you, Kim. We've got a lot more ahead of us. We've got a long way to go, but I like where I'm at as of today. So yeah. Um, and things have been light, you know, like where I feel like things have been kind of like dark feminine, dark energy. Um, it's like, it's like I'm working with the energy I'm getting from Kim and her tools. And then I'm also doing a lot of work with Kuan Yin right now. And, and I'm just feeling so like such a complete opposite. Things are just so much lighter right now. So it's not to say I don't want to get back to the darkness. Cause like, I mean, Hades is right here and like, I am itching to work with him, but I just know in my heart what I kind of need to be following right now. And, and this is kind of where I think I'm meant to be right now. And I'm focusing on that too. So much of this is about my practice being right now, you know, not then. Cause I, I was struggling with that. I think so much of my, um, so much of my triggers and so much of the, it, 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 it sits in the past and it's like, well, that was the past and you can't, you can't do that. You can't, you can't live in the past and you can't live in the future with expectations. You have to live now. So that's where I'm really, I know that's where my focus really needs to be. So with that said, um, one of like the 10 different like male inspos that I'm going to provide today is this man. Oh my gosh. I'll put his name in, uh, in the comments. His first name is Jamie. I believe he spells it J-A-Y-M-E-E. -E. Uh, but he is the host of this podcast that I found through, you know, lurking on Kim's Instagram. And the podcast is called Love is the Author. And it seems relatively new or else he takes his time with uploading because I think he only has like 55 or 56 episodes. But um, the sound quality is to die for. And you, just the moment you listen to this man speak, there's a softness and there's a genuineness and like a true desire to, to bring love and awareness to his listeners. And I've been, I've been absolutely hooked. And so much of this comes from a background in addiction and, um, He's, he's on a Buddhist path. I don't know if he's um, a Vajrayana Buddhist. I think he is. But he interviews Tibetan Buddhists and Zen Buddhists. And um, I'm more so affiliated with Chan Buddhism. But um, Buddhism is Buddhism and love is love. So like that's kind of like the, the root of all of this. That's like the core to his, to his essence with, with this podcast. And so he interviews just some amazing people such as Kim Cran that are really willing to like explore and deep dive like what love is and, and just how putting it out there in the universe will karmically bring it, bring it back, you know, three times over, 10 times over. So it's, it's like, it's been so, so special. So with that said, I think it was like the third episode that I listened to where he interviewed another woman that overcame addiction and now actually does sound bath, sound baths out in Ojai, California. And so like the first 40 to 45 minutes of the podcast, it opens up with her putting on basically a, a concert for us. Like, and, and it was so great because I was actually, it was a sunny day and I was sitting in, my little reading nook and I had the windows open and just like listening to the chimes and the bowls and the everything. And I was just like, Oh God, like this is what my soul needed right now, you know? So then she comes on and she kind of explains her story and like where she's been and, and where she's at now. 
sort of end. One thing that just took my breath away that I needed, I needed to, I say I needed to steal from her, but she offers it, um, is what I'm about to read to you. And she says she found it in a book, but she doesn't cite the book. So I can't cite this. If you guys have heard this, please let me know. <laughs> this goes back to my Envy painting. If you happen to know the original creator of this, please let me know so that I can cite them because they deserve to be respected and honored for, for this amazing, magical um, grouping of words. It's, it, yes. Anyway, so she says that this is what has helped her to forgive. And I know a lot of religions, a lot of spiritualists have ways of feeling forgiveness, you know, and forgiveness is hard. Forgiveness is heavy. And I think that, you know, for me personally, thinking back on a lot of the things I've been talking about and discussing over the past few weeks, we can, we, we, it's no surprise that forgiveness has been extremely hard for me. But I'm in this new phase and I'm in this, I'm, I'm, you know, taking a step in a different direction. And, and for me, forgiveness is necessary. Perhaps not so much for my dad, but for me it is. But it's an added bonus if, if it, you know, if, if it does help my dad too. So, so I'm going to share this with you and I'm going to type it in the comments portion, um, or, you know, below in, in, I can't with words today, my goodness. Um, so that if you guys want to refer to it, you most certainly can. So, um, one more thing, I guess you speak this to the person that you want to forgive and then you relay it back to yourself. So like, I'm going to say John, John Doe, but it's like, if your name is Richard Lucas Smith, you know, like you're going to refer to Richard Lucas Smith and, and speak this on his behalf. And then you're going to speak this on your behalf. John, John Doe. I forgive you freely and deeply. I forgive you for everything you ever did that I thought you shouldn't have done. Freely and deeply, I forgive you for everything that you didn't do that I felt you should have done. I release you from all bonds of fear, anger, shame, and guilt. I lose you and let you go, knowing that divine love heals whatever needs to be healed between us now and forever. L. Ashley Lazarite, I forgive you. Freely and deeply, I forgive you for everything you ever did that I thought you shouldn't have done. Freely and deeply, I forgive you for everything that you didn't do that I felt you shouldn't have done. I release you from all bonds of fear, anger, shame, and guilt. I lose you and let you go, knowing that divine love heals whatever needs to be healed between us now and forever. And I thought it was beautiful. I mean, the tears welled up in my eyes and I thought this is what I needed. And isn't it so funny how when you put things out in the universe, the things that you need appear, isn't it funny? It's so funny. So I want to share this with you guys, because if you, if you feel like you need this too, then you most certainly are, it needs to be at your disposal too, because I want you to have it. So, so yeah, powerful stuff. Had to share it. I had to share it. So one more sip, and then let's just kind of get into some men that inspire me. So like I said, love is the air, Jamie, last name unknown until I post this <laughs> and then I'll let you know in the comments. He's one of them. Thank God for people like him and we need more of them. So thank you, Jamie. 
And then I decided to pick just like random people that we all will know and you might have different thoughts and feels and that's okay. And I respect, you know, how you feel and whether or not you, you agree or disagree and, um, feel free to comment about them, you know, down below, you know, like, did this person do other philanthropic um, things or charity work and funding that you were just like so like impressed by? Um, or are they not so good? Is there something that I don't know about them that I maybe need to know? Um, but just when I, when I first thought of names, you know, without Googling, without researching or anything, I thought there's something about them that feels like they just have a good heart. So I just, I just wanted to call them out. And so the first, and some of these might be really quirky and silly. The first one I thought of was Jimmy Fallon because, and I don't watch, I don't watch the, it's the late show, right? I don't watch it often enough. We don't have cable, but I watch it when I go to my mom's and, um, he just wants to make people laugh. I feel like sincerely every night he, he comes on and he just wants to make people laugh. And he also wants to make people kind of like get it too, if that makes sense. I don't know if you know what I mean. I'm not trying to like be vague here, but um, <laughs> I just think there's a, a large portion of America that like just doesn't get it. And Jimmy Fallon does such a good job at like tactfully trying to get people to like build their awareness. So, so he's, like, he's on my list. Barack Obama. I mean, come on. Every time you hear him speak and whether or not you agree with the words that he says, there's just a, a sort of calmness, um, reservedness, if that's a word, where he, he wants to invite everybody into the room and, and listen to their opinions and, and build a better community. He and Michelle, um, you know, Becoming, I read, you know, I read, I think she's got two books now, but I read Becoming. Anyway, I digress. That's a female. She's not on the list. <laughs> I put the Dalai Lama, but I, I think about the Dalai Lama and I, and I, I go back and forth with this and here are my reasons why. Of course, the Dalai Lama, his holiness. I mean, if there is but one male that strives to do it right moment by moment. I firmly believe it is the Dalai Lama. And perhaps it's, you know, um, just holy men in general. And maybe it's the robes. But like, I tend to think of him as very androgynous. Um, it, perhaps in a sense, he does such a great job at seamlessly blending his masculine and feminine energy that I don't really see him as a male, but he is his holiness. So he does deserve to be on the list. <laughs> Jamie Oliver. And, and this one's funny that it even came to mind <laughs> because he, he's kind of the lowest on my list. If I were to be honest with you, <laughs> I know this is so silly, but like, I think it's that like physically I'm not attracted to him at all. Like I, I think I tried to do blue hair, blue hair. I never tried to do blue hair. Uh, blonde hair, blue eyes twice in my life. And both times it ended really badly. It just like, it, blonde hair, blue eyes just like, isn't my type. <laughs> it just like does not work out. Um, and like, he's almost like too bubbly, like too bubbly on screen. Like, I tend to just be cynical by nature. And so somebody that's like a little too bubbly tends to irritate me. <laughs> and so he's, he's like, kind of like, he pushes it with me, but I believe he's still married to this day. He's got kids. You can tell he loves them dearly when you watch, you know, all of his cooking shows, he's got his kids involved. And, um, I think he really tries to go out and do some innovative, um, like outreach to get people to be more familiar with, with, I guess, farm to table cooking, you know? And I really appreciate that. I really appreciate that. And I honestly, it's, it's something about EU UK that I feel like we just don't have here in the States. Like we, I think we try to do farm to table, but I think everything is just so fast paced and, you know, high production that like we can't 
we just can't do it as well as the EU UK does. So yeah, hopefully that'll change, but I have this feeling that's just how the States is, unfortunately. Tom Hanks and George Clooney, just, they go hand in hand and they're both really philanthropic and they've both been, you know, I think as soon as you see either of their faces, they radiate goodness. They radiate just, just being a decent man. And there's really nothing else to say. I mean, I, I gotta be honest, I'm not even really like a movie buff. Like I can't, I can't list off like, so Tom Hanks was in You've Got Mail and Forrest Gump. And there's like a slew of other ones, Saving Private Ryan. I'm going to embarrass myself because all of a sudden I'm going to list something that he wasn't in. And George Clooney was in The Ocean's Eleven, like all those movies with Julia Roberts. And I can't tell you what else he's been in, but I just feel like whenever I see them in the news... There's never anything bad to be said about either of these men. They're just, they're good hearted men. So they, they deserved to be on the list. Damn it. <laughs> so now we're going to switch gears. And I thought of just two areas where like, I'm personally always, um, like directly influenced because my husband, it takes part in both bonsai and in pottery. And I thought about how both bonsai and pottery are these loving, like slow moving, creative, artistic hobbies that in my mind are ma more masculine than feminine, but um, like just a nerdy thing to throw out there. Like my husband is like like vice president of the local bonsai club here. It's so nerdy. It's so adorable and cute, but let's be honest, it's kind of nerdy. <laughs> and so, you know, he, they bring in a lot, they bring blah, 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 words today, I swear to God. They bring in a lot of um, artists, like professional bonsai tree growers, you know, to show how to artistically, you know, design a tree <laughs> and um a lot of them are men I think my husband said that there was one woman I don't remember if she came in the past or she's coming this year but one woman that was going to come and and, and give a master class um and there are women in the club and and two of I think the, the four or five people in my husband's study group are women and so there's something about that that I super appreciate too. Like the men are completely open to have women be part of what could have become like this old boys club, but most certainly is not. Um, and everybody kind of, you know, discusses their opinions and, and, and even within bonds, I know enough to be stupid, but they talk about masculine balance and feminine balance and how, um, certain, God, I, I want to say concepts, but like Illerati might be like a version of like, just like a design element within bonsai. And I, I can't say one way or the other. My husband would, if he was here right now, he'd probably be laughing in the room, trying to listen to me discuss bonsai with you guys. But there's a, there's a feminine approach to the style of the tree versus a masculine approach. And people will get knocked like, you know, cause you'll go your bonsai trees will get judged and you'll, you'll get knocked points if it's like not masculine enough or not feminine enough. And I find that fascinating. You know, it's just a tree, but no, like you have to like sculpt it to be a certain way. Anyway, and there's so much thought that goes into that, right? And it's slow thought. You don't make rash judgments or movements because if you cut off an entire branch, I mean, it could be detrimental for hundreds of years until, until that tree kind of like comes back and regrows and, and, and whatnot. So you really do, um, think before you act within bonsai and, and there's so many aspects, you know, that I really haven't touched base on that I find very, very beautiful and very balanced within that art. And then, um, and then pottery too. I mean, just the whole idea of, of, of sculpting and working with clay and being grounded and, and um, the men that I know that, that 
do pottery do have feminine qualities and that's not a bad thing i think they're just in touch with themselves um in slash on that level and um i've been able to have some really deep really cool conversations with um with like my husband's instructor the man that you know started my husband off in pottery and and he's actually become really good friends with his instructor and um yeah, and it's it might be funny too that I just think pottery and bonsai go hand in hand. There's so much to, like a lot of the pots like my husband will um what's the word I'm thinking of when he, you know, he puts them in the kiln. He'll fire a lot of pots that then he'll actually wind up using to put his trees in um and sells them too. So I think it's kind of cool that those hobbies go hand in hand. Um and unfortunately, those are the only two kind of like masculine hobbies that I can think of that that are soft and um, kind of have this feminine twist on them that, that brings them balance. You know, I, I don't want to touch sports because I think a lot of sports is very brash and, and, and you know, uh, warrior kind of energy. And, and that's not, not the energy I'm, I'm looking for. Um, right here within my examples, but I mean, like, let's open up the conversation. I'm sure as I've been talking, there's been another hobby or two that comes to mind. So please share, please share. And then lastly, because I'm a musician and because I'm so inspired by music, I, I immediately started thinking of some musicians that have really inspired me through the years. And uh, the first one is Hosier. I mean, and I do probably have a little crush on him. No, not probably. Like, it's known. It's known. Like, for instance, here's a funny little story. So my husband and I actually got married in Scotland. Uh, we got engaged in Scotland, too. And weirdly enough, during the dates of our wedding, um, I guess that Hosier was playing a show in Glasgow. And... Word has it that my husband tried to like reach out to his people or whatever to see if Hosier would like be willing to play for our wedding and, and he never got through. But the sentiment, like I was so fucking sweet. Like my husband is just friggin' adorable. And I've just always loved Hosier for being a true musician, you know, being authentic to the whole creative aspect of music making from start to finish. I mean, all of those lyrics are genuinely from his soul and, and all of that music is constructed by him. And, and, and if you go down a rabbit hole of, of you know, analyzing his lyrics, um, you'll see that he, he doesn't rush that process. He takes his time. And I mean, prominent songs like Take Me to Church, there's significant meaning, you know, behind behind those 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 beautiful pieces of work so so Hosier is is one is probably my top one um Sam Smith I just love Sam Smith who doesn't love Sam Smith like I don't know there's not a season that doesn't bode well for just jamming out to Sam Smith I mean am I right <laughs> like his voice is just it's like Adele's but she's not on the list. And I always think like, you know, if Adele and him like hooked up and did like a, like a mashup of like their duet would be like, like what was the one that Mariah Carey and Whitney Houston came out with like in the nineties? Like it would be that impressive or like the one that Barbara Streisand and Celine Dion came, like it would be that massive of a hit. Am I right? <laughs> um, anyway, but Sam Smith and, and when you, listen to a lot of his interviews and a lot of the things that he's gone through um you can't help but feel for him and 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 just feel his music and um i definitely recommend if you haven't given it a chance and this might be what i i post as a as a link his tiny desk concert on npr was just so cool so cool he's the coolest like like i totally want him to be my best buddy but He's rich and famous, so. <laughs> okay, next on the list is 
I mean, okay, I grew up with Queen. I grew up with Queen. My mom, like, had Queen playing on the record player. And so I don't know. It just, like, I almost wonder if she was playing Queen when I was, like, in the womb. Because Queen is just, like, I swear part of my soul. And I'm going to link my favorite song of all time. Because Freddie Mercury just milks it. It's just him and the piano, and it's divine. And that's all I have to say. Queen. Long live the queen. <laughs> And lastly, because of my classical background, I can't help but have a soft space for Peter Ilyich Tchaikovsky. Go and research his works if you're not familiar with classical literature. A lot of his symphonies are a representation of the struggles that he faced with being gay. And the fifth symphony in E minor, oh, it's gonna be, I've played that symphony a handful of times, maybe four times. And it's hard for me to get through. Um, like I will be on stage and have to fight through tears because I can feel his struggle. Oh. And I don't know if you guys, you know, I mean, if any of you are musicians, you'll know what I'm kind of like experiencing right now because there's this feeling when the music's live and it's around you. And there's nothing quite like being on the stage with acoustic instruments in a 70 some piece orchestra. There's nothing quite like it. Um, if anything, that's maybe why I play. It's it's not just to play my own part. It's to be surrounded by all of the cacophony that's around me. It's absolutely no words. But to feel his struggles through through that, and you'll you can find um, I forget. I think it's called the symphony. It's a huge thick book. I should have brought it up here to show it to you guys. Um, but it will go through the creation of, of like Mozart, Mahler, uh, Berlioz, Debussy, like all of their prominent works. And you'll, you'll get like a kind of like, like a behind the music VH1 deep dive of like how this music came about, what inspired these composers to write this music. And I got the book cause it's like, I'm playing this music and, and right now it's just notes on a page, but like, I want to know what was going through that composer's mind when he wrote this part. And especially, like, as an oboist, because the oboe winds up being such a soloistic instrument within the orchestra. It's like, well, why is this solo happening right now? Like, what is he trying to say? And and it's not just Tchaikovsky. I mean, this is, this is classical music, like, just as a whole. But um, Tchaikovsky specifically has always spoken to me since I was young. And specifically... Uh, his symphony in, his fifth symphony in E minor. So I will link that too. I believe it's 40 minutes, but um, it's beautiful. And if it doesn't make you cry, what's wrong with you? <laughs> anyway, that's all I have for today, this Venus day. I hope that it's gonna bring you some love. I hope it's gonna bring you some giggles. Um, and I appreciate you sharing uh, some time with me today. Cheers guys, and we'll talk soon.